please welcome producer Susan Downey. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming on a Saturday morning. Well, thank you for being here, Susan. Um, when I was watching the film, I was, I was um, admiring the bravery of the Downey family, not, not just Robert Sr. and Jr. and your kids, but also yourself. Um, can you tell us about um, diving into a project like this and, and understanding that you guys were going to dive into some serious aspects of, of your personal life well, I think this was honestly more of a boiling the frog scenario than diving into a deep end, you know, because we didn't really know what we were doing exactly. And in, in so much as like, we knew that there was gonna be this thing that Robert wanted to do, you know, Chris Smith had come to us about doing something on Robert. Robert had no interest in doing something on himself, but very much was interested in doing something on his father with his father. And so we just started shooting stuff with them and it became the project and then as you saw senior had his version of the project and that went on for years and then covid hit and we gave him cameras and did these interviews and all. but we honestly didn't really know where we were going and so you get to that point where exton's going with robert into the city to see senior for the last time and it, in term, and it, I had sort of done an interview around then for it. We just kept kind of evolving it. And so I appreciate that in retrospect, we look really brave. But at the time, we were just going with the flow. And I had no idea if anyone outside our family was ever going to see it. Um, when I saw the film at, at Telluride Film Festival, it felt to me that it was an incredible gift that the you know junior is doing to his dad was that part of the impetus or uh, the oh yeah 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 there was some drive that robert had that he probably couldn't articulate where he just he wanted to do this for his dad i think as much as for himself again this is my observation of it um i think on the one hand he loved that it really engaged senior you know as the film shows you um, their bond was always through movies. And even when we talked to him, obviously once we had kids, there'd be the occasional how's the grandkids question, but for the most part, it's like, have you seen fill in the blank? No, we haven't yet, senior. You haven't seen it? No, you really gotta see it. Like whatever it is, some obscure thing he's watched. And so that was like, their connection was always through that. And so I think part of it was him giving his, pro his dad this final project. And I think part of it was himself trying to see like, what can I resolve or understand or learn before it's too late, which again, wasn't done with a known ticking clock. We didn't set out realizing seniors end was you know within a few years. Um, you mentioned that you had no idea where this film would go the moment that you guys started. Yeah. At what point did you guys understand that that you had a film in the direction of where it was gonna go? That's a good question. Um, you know, we, a couple years in, we had a cut of the movie. And um, we did what I kind of call the proof of concept screening just for us, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like going in a little like skeptical, like, oh my God, is there any reason this needs to exist? Is this just something that we'll like because we're the family? Will it work for people who don't even know Senior? And um, at that time, it obviously had nothing uh, with his decline, okay, because mm -hmm. that hadn't happened yet, and um, or at least his steep decline. And, uh, and I remember watching that and coming out and going, wow, this is a, this is a pretty inspirational portrait of an artist somebody who thinks outside the box. Um, you know, and obviously I come from making like the big Hollywood movies and mm -hmm. I was like very much inspired by just even that portion of it. Um, and then I think, you know, once COVID hit and Robert and Senior were doing these series of conversations, we were sort of lacing those in, not sure again how that was gonna work. Um, but to answer the question, I think that 
honestly, until, until Chris Smith really put it together after senior passed and we saw how this could work, because there's so many levels playing, Correct. you know, yeah. and you're like, wow, can we get all those levels to work? Um, I think it was really that deep into it that we felt we had something that we could share with the world. Um, you speak about the different levels, and yes, it's like multi-level. Yeah. You have a father-son uh, bonding that is so inspirational. Then you have somebody battling with Parkinson's. Then on top of that, you have, you know, celebrating a, a rebel in independent cinema mm -hmm. that changed the way we and inspired other independent filmmakers like Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, there is so many themes going into into it. Did you understand? Did you understand that there were all those different levels? Um, yes and no. I saw that we had um, we had because well, the other level that that you missed was that senior doing his own movie. Which is, which is yeah. a level two, yeah. him ultimately doing what we come to realize is his final project. And um, so what I, I saw going in was I saw Robert wanting to do a move, like a, 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 an investigation, a documentary about his father. So that's one level I saw. I saw Senior very obsessed in wanting to do whatever his project was. But jumping back, Chris Smith and I are like, this is really about fathers and sons. And this is about kind of art and life. And so mm -hmm. I saw those three levels um, pretty early on, but I think they became more nuanced as we got the footage and put it together. And ultimately, you get this heartfelt meditation on life itself yes. that is so... That, that's the one I didn't expect. I mean, honestly, because again, we didn't set out like, oh, he's been told he has, you know, three years to live, let's get going. Like, it was nothing like that. And with Parkinson's, as, as you know, and I experienced it with my father, there isn't um, a, an exact timeline. People can live with it for, you know, decades. Um, or it can hit and kind of take a steep decline. And um, I think with COVID, um, you know, senior wasn't as, my, my dad, well, my mom was militant about getting my dad up and moving every day. And that's a huge thing with Parkinson's. And I think with COVID, senior was uh, in his apartment a lot and ultimately in his bed a lot. And that just makes the decline incredibly steep. Um, so I think that, you know, it's, again, we, we didn't know that part until much, much later. And so the meditation on life didn't come until we were able to put it all together. Mm -hmm. So did you, like the last, I'm thinking about the last moment where Robert talks to us, Junior, about, you know, the meditation, I mean, the, the just the position of art and life, and had you guys already understood by that point that, that it was a meditation on, on life? And that's why that scene was all about, or you guys were still trying to th figure things out? Are you talking about when he's in the like hanging chair under Correct. the tree? Yeah, yeah. I mean, clearly he was onto something. <laughs> I think that he, I, I think he was still trying to put it all together. I think he was still trying to figure out and sort of say, I don't know, what is this? Is it this? Is it that? Um, because again, it's 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 so many things. I think that there's, um, you know, in our society, like we don't really face death. You know, we kind of like to Correct. pretend it might not happen. And, <laughs> and of course, this is everyone's story. It kind of transcends being just about Robert and his dad, and it becomes something that, you know, we sort of all experience. And I think the other dimension of that is I think that um, there's this belief that you're going to have some sort of reconciliation or closure. You're going to get all your answers, you know, before it's too late. And mm -hmm. as you saw in here, like, you know, maybe if we scripted it, there'd be some massive cathartic, like, you know, all answers mm -hmm. in. But when you're not scripted, real life takes over and you realize that it's just completely imperfect. I was accelerated to watch how the clips that you show of Robert uh, Sr.'s um, films actually start telling us about his life. Um, how, you know, tell us about... That was all Chris Smith. Honestly, like he 
we had been playing around with sort of the shape and the structure, and obviously there's something you know linear to it, but can't be too linear because it's senior. He's never going to let you be that linear, plus all the different layers that are going on and all that. But at a certain point, Chris said to me, you know, I have an idea. I want to try something, and he kind of went away for about three weeks with an editor that he he really likes, and and he said, I, I I'm just I'm trying something structurally. Tell me what you think. And so we got the cut. Robert and I sat and watched it, and it was it was what you just recognized, which is we all saw and you see in here like seniors not going to tell you anything. You try and ask a question, and he's so evasive about it. He just deflects, deflects, and it's like, and Chris kind of realized, but he gave us the answers. And it's in the movies he did. And he was turning, and Robert even says this, I believe, in there. He says, you know, he's sort of turning a lens on what he wants to say. And so Chris is like, great, let's decode it that way. And he had this sort of brilliant idea of really shaping it around the movies that he did. And, you know, if we could do the three hour version, there's actually some really interesting other movies he did that gave us even further insight. Mm. Um, but yeah, I thought I, when, once we saw that version, Robert and I looked at each other. And we were just like, oh my God, this is, this is it. That was only closer to the beginning of this year. This was, was kind of like springtime of this year. And we saw that cut and we're like, ooh, I think, wait, I think we know what the movie is now. And, and to that point, a very late addition was uh, the bingo scene at the very end. You know, And that was something where Chris said, you know, if there's ever a scene that Robert really loves and hasn't made it in, let me know. And, and that was sort of always sitting out there as a request from Chris. And so we watched it and I'm like, hmm. And I sent it to Chris and I'm like, I think there's a place for this somewhere at the end. Because there's so much that's being said in it. And he found the placement for it. Like I didn't know if it was gonna be end of credits or where. Um, but it goes back to, oh yeah, he's telling us everything he wanted to say in the way that he was comfortable doing it. Um, you mentioned Zoom and COVID, I mean COVID, and you know, there are so many sessions during the film that is, uh, you know, Zoom sessions between junior and senior, yeah. but you break it up throughout the film where it's not about COVID, right. it's about, you know, the main themes. Can you tell us about that, that process? It must have been really difficult. Well, what was interesting is it's one of those that became, I think, a little bit of um, a blessing in that, you know, Robert was supposed to go do a trip out to see Senior, and they would have had a couple more days and probably done some sort of conversation, talks, et cetera. But when COVID hit and travel was not possible, even though Senior didn't seem to understand that, he kept saying, when you're coming out, and we're just like, uh, when there's not a pandemic, he's like, oh, he didn't get it at all. But finally... Um, Kevin Ford, who is featured in The One Who Sits With Senior and does a lot of the editing, he's like, let's just send him, and I'll talk to someone on his end, we'll set up one of those GoPros, we'll set it up on Robert's side, and we'll have the Zoom, we'll be able to have these conversations. And so we said, sure, let's see. And they blocked out, you know, each like conversation they had was going to cover a certain period of time, and they stuck to it, and they got through all the decades of his life and his work. And you know, I thought to myself, like, how fortunate is that to have, you know, the opportunity, the means, and the excuse of making a doc to have those conversations with somebody who's so important to you in your life. Like, I didn't have those with my dad. I had a great relationship with him, but I didn't have those conversations because that would have been, again, back to my earlier point, acknowledging like his time was limited. They didn't have to acknowledge it. They just had to say, we're making a movie, so we get to talk. <laughs> Um, you 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 mentioned the aspect of the um, uh, Robert and being a rebel and the fact that he decided to make his own version of the a, a doc. Yeah. Um, from your perspective, it was that him being the rebel that he was, or actually <laughs> needing to create his own his own version of a doc. I would argue those are the same things. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, it is absolute, that is who he is. You know, his version, as Robert said, is not particularly linear. It's all the outtakes. It's like we have that great interview with Alan Arkin. We could only use what we could use, you know, just for space and time. But there's this outtake of Alan where he's talking. He's like, you know, 
I think I'm going to get a kumquat. And he like stands up and he goes to this kumquat bush. And that's the only part that Senior used in his version. <laughs> so that gives you a little taste of like, it's just that is who he was. It was true to who he was. And it was his way, whether he's aware of it or not. And again, my take on it. But it was his way of participating and speaking to us to Robert was through film and mm -hmm. doing his version. So it was it was his coping mechanism Correct. for his ability to do it. So I, again, I think the, it's the same thing. But did he see the the stuff that Chris was doing with you guys and understood ultimately the things that you guys were doing to, doing on the sidelines? Yeah, he had very little interest in it um, <laughs> and was uh, far more interested in what he was doing. He would often tell Kevin that, you know, ours is the real project. You know, it was, it was like, I don't know what they're doing over there, but this is the real movie. And, uh, and he really felt that way. He also used to, as Kevin, he and Kevin were putting together stuff, and a lot of it was, which is, this is kind of interesting just from a, um, you know, sort of a person, again, facing the end of their life is one of the biggest joys he had in doing his version was going through all of his movies and picking and, and re-watching them all. Mm -hmm. Every single thing he's done, pulling out scenes of them. And that to him, as he says in here, is the most important part for him. And that was something that he really enjoyed. And at one point, I know he and Kevin were working on it and he sort of leaned over to Kevin and he's like, now this is the part where they're gonna walk out. Like, I mean, that's what he was trying to do. He wanted to provoke an audience. He was looking for the wackiest way to get people to respond. Um, I know the answer why you guys went all black and white yeah. um, and with the little burst of color throughout the piece. It's gorgeous, it looks stunning, and immerses us into Robert Downey Sr.'s um, world. I would love to hear how it, that came about and, you know, the black and white. Sure. Yeah, well, so it was really something that was born out of Chris and um, Kevin working on the edit. And, you know, everybody involved was incredibly inspired by Senior. And, um, and the fact that he really just created his own vision for things. He wasn't interested in structurally what people normally do or, frankly, what people normally do with any part of filmmaking. And at one point they were in the edit and they just kind of flipped the switch to black and white. And they were like, this feels right. This feels like an appropriate kind of ode to his work. And then from that point on, we shot it with that in mind and knowing that we were the only things in color we were going to do were things that were seniors movies. In fact, there was one point where we had shot um, some like eight millimeter stuff that were establishing shots, like of the windmill house. We shot it both ways, obviously, because the regular is in there now. Um, and we put those pops of color and it didn't seem right. And so we decided to keep everything black and white really as a tribute to Senior. And it was something that, um, again, was a choice that Chris made along with, with Kevin. And we all just signed on to and said, let's, let's go for it. There's a mystery to his films that I, I love. And I mentioned to you that Robert Sr. and I had interactions, and, and me being a film geek, loving to deconstruct things, he would never fess up and never uh, talk about his films and explanations. From your vantage point, you know, tell us how what for you as a producer, how that dynamic was for you? Well, same experience you had. You know, <laughs> you try and talk to him and dig deeper, and, you know, he sort of takes a moment, he muses at whatever you've worked very hard to determine. You know, I'm a student of film, I love, like, you pulling things apart and ascribing meaning to things and all of that. And, you know, he would always feign kind of, like, exhaustion, disgust that anyone would <laughs> try and do that to his movies. But, I mean, he's a, he's a wickedly smart guy, and he knew exactly what he was doing. But I don't think he was putting anyone on. I think that truly, I, I don't even know that he understood. But then again, who knows? Like, those early interviews, the Dick Cavett one, like, he clearly knew he was trying to say a little bit more. And um, 
So that is, I think, one of the beautiful mysteries that can remain a mystery or people can determine on their own how intentional things were, how sub-intentional things were. I just think he was a true, true artist, which is the thing that I came to respect in making this because prior to that, he was just like Robert's dad who made these weird films. And um, you know, when you would walk around the city with him, he'd be like, would you look at those guys? And he'd be like commenting on everyone and you're just like, oh my God, like <laughs> someone's gonna hear this and take it wrong. And so it wasn't until we got to do this deep dive that I came to respect him even more as an artist. I don't know if that's a good thing to admit or not, but I, I appreciate that it happened. Um, and I'm just curious, the fact that you produced this and somewhat of a mastermind for it all, but at the same time, you're a, uh, 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 the wife and also you're the in-law um, and the mother to the children as well who are involved in the film. How, how did you cope with it all, manage it all? Well, during production, I was just supportive of everything. I was just kind of like, what do they want to do? How can I help it get done? Um, you know, just Exton was going to the city with dad, please try and sleep, try and not eat too much junk. Like, you know, just kind of being mom, what do we need to do from a logistical standpoint? Let's just get all the footage like that. That was the intention because we also weren't at the time working with anyone. Like we were just, it was us. It was Kevin and Emily, who's one of the other producers. Um, and then Chris Smith and his partner, this gal Ryan, and it was just these three couples making it. So we didn't have to answer to anyone, so I knew like, let's capture footage, we control it, so I wasn't worried about anything, you know? Mm -hmm. In fact, I didn't even know they interviewed Exton, that beautiful interview they do in New York when he talks about why he came and wants to see his, his grandfather. So the real part in terms of putting on the producer hat or the storyteller hat or any of those things came in post. And basically, Chris Smith and I just kind of like locked arms and like I let him lead the way but supported what he wanted to do. And one of the rules Robert had early on was I want to keep it small. Like I said, it was just sort of these three couples. But everything's, you know, nothing's off limits. And, um, and so what we were doing was just trying to find the emotional journey for this mm -hmm. and following the emotional story. And there's beautiful sequences and information on the cutting room floor about Senior's mother, about other inspirations for him, about, like I said before, other movies he'd done and what we interpreted those to say about him. But we really locked into the emotional journey and that as as a producer, as a storyteller, whether you're doing a narrative or you're doing a doc is the key thing. And if you can find it, and we had obviously two amazing leads in ours, which also makes things easy, and we had a beginning, middle, and end, you know, it, it makes the job easier. And I didn't feel overly protective mm. of anyone because it was so clear that this was seniors absolute wish to see this through. Mm. So it never felt there was a compromise there. And as far as Exton's involvement, he so wanted to be a part of it that, um, again, I wasn't too worried. I mean, honestly, I was more worried at the ridiculous hats Robert wore throughout this <laughs> and how much he was like chowing on his Nicorette gum the whole time. Like in the edit, that to me was like, how much do I protect this guy? you know, um, than, than any of the storytelling. Um, the, the sucker punch in the film is the, the, the last moment of senior and junior and uh, your son, and it's gut-wrenching, and it is so raw. What was it like for you to see that footage? Well, I lost it, I was crying, you know, like, like I, I think it was, but I thought it was so beautiful. It's stunning. You know, him surrounded by all the like baseball paraphernalia, just like you'd want someone to be. And the fact that, you know, Exton was very aware of what was going on. You know, early early on there was a cut that I think Chris had showed to his, a friend and, and his friend said, do you have any footage, any interview footage of asking Exton, you know, him asking like, how's grandpa doing or what's what's going on? Like when they're in New York. 
And I was like, that's the dumbest note I've ever heard because it couldn't be clearer that he knew exactly what was happening and exactly what the scenario was by which they were visiting him. And I think there was such a beauty to these, this sort of three generation of Downies being able to have that incredible moment. And um, so when I saw it, I was, I was joyful that it happened and I was, you know, really torn up. I mean, it's, it's a hard, you know, that whole last, we'll call it last act is really hard to, to watch, but it's also really life affirming at the same time. You know, it's not a downer. And then we had a cut where we did end, you know, after the memorial, after Robert saying, I loved him for what he did, I loved him for what he didn't do, which I just love that statement. Um, and then it went up to the tree and we were out and into the credits. And that's when we put the bingo thing in. We realized, no, 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 with senior, you got to end with a laugh. Correct. You got to, not just a laugh, but like a profound laugh, like whatever that means, <laughs> you know? And it was like the perfect, perfect balance to take, you know, whatever we were just feeling in that last section and with that hug and all that and feel like okay walking out of the theater. Um, I told you that I saw it in Telluride and um, I was so blown up. Going in, I was going like, okay, this is going to speak to me because my dad died of Parkinson's and, and we have, you know, I connect to the, and I knew Robert uh, Sr., and I'm a cinephile, but I was blown away when I, the first screening that it was um, striking a chord with everybody. There, there is such specificity about the work that you did, but it has this amazing universality, it speaks to everybody in, in some way or another. Did you understand that when you were making the film or even after you finished it? I would say after we finished it, to be perfectly honest, because um, you know I hadn't seen it prior to Telluride with more than five people in the room, and obviously there were people I knew, and so um, watching it that that first screening in Telluride just blew me away, and the second screening was like somehow even stronger. It was like you were on a ride with people on a roller coaster ride, and what I realized that was so amazing is again we sort of just put our nose down and wanted to tell something truthful. And when you do that, there wasn't, you know, there was no ego involved and there was, there was no set agenda involved other than to try and explore the relationship and allow these two men in this period of time to do what they thought they were doing. And um, I think that the thing that's really been incredible is, yeah, you know, maybe people leave this and be like, I gotta watch some of seniors' movies, you know, and, and that's great, and, and that certainly is a, a, a thing that we would have wanted to accomplish, but the beauty of it is the conversations you have afterwards, and the fact that it immediately takes down that wall because you're like, you know, you have people coming up after and saying, like you did to me, like, I lost my father with, from Parkinson's, or you have somebody saying, I had, you know, kind of bohemian parents that were a little wacky and I really understand, you know, you just, you immediately jump into these personal conversations because it is everybody's story. You know, parents die, it's what happens. You know, families are complicated. You know, people, past generations make bad choices um, based on the, you know, what's happening in the world at that time. And I think that it, the fact that we were able to have something that resonated for people um, at that level was not something I expected. I feel foolish to not have expected it, but I, I really didn't until that first screening, and then it's been you know, consistent at each screen. I mean, I can ask this audience, like, did you guys connect to this beyond just the Robert you and you know, senior part of it? Yeah, so that, it was, it was, it's been incredible. Well, thank you for the bravery that the family undertook to make this film. And, and thank you for being here today, Susan. It's a powerful, powerful film. Thank you for having me, and thanks, everyone, for coming out.